Good evening. Uh, thank you for so much for joining our webinar today. I'm Nick Yap, your caring pharmacist and the host for today. Uh, today, we are going to tackle the hardest topic to talk for men, which is erectile dysfunction. Uh, erectile dysfunction, if you are not sure what it is, it is the inability to get and keep an erection firm enough for sex. And it is especially common among older men. This is really the hardest topic to talk for men, especially for Asians. You know, we are more shy and we are more reluctant to open up regarding sexual health. That's just how, uh, how we operate, that's, that's you know, who we are. Uh, most will just Google it or even find some products on the social media to solve their problem. Uh, but this can be very dangerous as the internet and the social media is full of this information and bogus treatments, right? So, which is why it is such an honor for us to have the very best person to talk about this topic with us today. I'm sure most, if not all of us here, know him very, very well. So, please welcome consultant urology surgeon from Bland Eagles Hospital, KL, who has extensive research and working experience in this field, Professor Dr. George Lee. Hi, Nick. Thank you so Hi. much for, yeah, for this Hi. wonderful opportunity. Really, really an honor for us to have you today. I don't think we need any more introduction on you. I think 99%, if not 100% of all participants know you very well, especially when it comes to uh, men health. You are the doctor, right? You are the face right. for men health. Well, so, you're truly uh, putting Dr. G on the spot today. Yeah, I love your articles, by the way, Dr. G. All right, okay, right. <laughs> Before we start, let's talk about what a consultant urology surgeon does. Oh, Most right. of us know Dr. Josh Lee very, very well, but to a lesser extent, what a urologist really does. Uh, I did not cook this up, huh? but when my mom told my dad that I'll be talking with you today, the first reaction from my dad is, oh, that's the, the sex doctor. I read his articles on the newspaper, you know, ah, I know him. Uh, but I'm sure there's so much more to the role of a urologist other than that. So can you tell us more about your role as a consultant urology surgeon? Okay, I mean, most people, well, thank you very much for this opportunity. I can see that you're all uh, ready with your blue screen at the back for the Blue Diamond talk. <laughs> blue Diamond, yeah, blue. Yeah, but, well, I, um, Sally, is in my humble home, in my study, but I really am quite excited to invite you to my home to tell you about the sort of research we do and also what we do as a urologist. Well, I am actually a urologist that uh, deal with anything that touches urine. Can you imagine that, you know, kidney stones, for example, you know, uh, things that people don't really know that we do is that 30% of our clients actually are women. You know, you imagine that women have got urinary tract infection, incontinence. Sadly, also women have cancers that are related to urology, such as kidney cancer, bladder cancer, and also um, other things. The most common things that I deal with perhaps is prostate. I also deal with many things to do with children, for example, circumcisions. And I was trained in UK. I started my career as a um, transplant surgeon, as a pharmacologist, believe it or not, in Cambridge. And then in Cambridge, I also deal with transplant and also other things such as gender reassignment and infertility. So in summary, as a urologist, my job is full of fascinations. That's what makes me wake up every day and looking forward to work. And one of the exciting things that capture your attention when you come to listen to me is talk about sex, right? Okay. And then obviously, sex is one part of my job. It's not the whole part, but that's the main part is that when we talk about sex, we're talking about overall health. We're not talking about just sexual health because sex is part of our bodily function. And therefore, if something is wrong with your sexual health, something is wrong with your overall health. So we have to change our perception. Dr. George Lee is not just about men's health, not just about prostate, right? So Dr. George Lee is about uh, everything, men and women, anything that touches the urine or the urinary tract. So uh, before we proceed with our discussion, be sure to stay with us until the end of the webinar because we'll be having a giveaway for three lucky winners for basic health screening from Glen Eagles Hospital KL worth uh, 500 ringgit each and also another three lucky winners to win carrying cash vouchers worth 50 ringgit. So if you have any questions, please leave it down below. We will try our best to get Dr. Josh Lee to answer them later. But if you are too shy, no worries. You can always private message the caring pharmacy moderator. So uh, we will get your questions as well. Uh, so 
Our topic for today surrounds the hardest topic to discuss among men, erectile dysfunction. So doctor, can you give us your professional advice on what is erectile dysfunction and how common it is in Malaysia? Well, I'm glad you asked me this question because I actually prepared some slides. I'm hoping that I can share some slides with you. And then basically, if you look at this, uh, hopefully you can get to see my slides. And then, can you do that? Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. okay, brilliant. So that's my beginning slide. And then basically, there's a bit of a disclaimer, but I would like to just to tell you a little bit about what is defined as erectile dysfunction. Actually, in the old days, you know, you were not born before that. Prior to 1998, something happened in 1998, but everybody just used to call erectile dysfunction with derogative names. Like, for example, can't get it up, impotency, and that sort of thing. And then, you know, people relate that with older men, it's aging process and it's really quite derogative. But essentially, erectile dysfunction is a very simple definition. It's that inability to sustain and maintain good enough erection for penetrative sex. But erectile dysfunction itself actually make it less of derogative term. So therefore, it is important for us to address that rather than actually make it quite a, uh, you know, belittle a situation like that. So erectile dysfunction itself is a very common condition. Nick, do you want to know how common it is? For me, because for me, the, 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 the perception is that it is something that is related to elderly. So if you ask me to guess, I would say probably, you know, elderly probably you will have a huge, a huge uh, percentage of them. But for young people, probably you will only have probably about 10 to 10 or 15%. That would be my guess. Okay, all right. So that depends. You have to be very careful because how do you define elderly? Dr. G is 53 years old. Do you think <laughs> that is elderly? You look young. You look young. No worries. Okay, all right. That, that's redeem yourself. But let me tell you a little bit. If you walk around the streets in KL, in Lumut, in Kota Baru, where I'm from, you actually can expect across all ages, men, one in three men will have erectile dysfunction. So three in 10 men, this is a very large study that was done for the Malaysian. Uh, every decade, we have a report card. It's called National Health and uh, Mobility Survey. So in that survey in 2019, which didn't really get too much limelight, I actually highlighted that this is what we expect. About 30 to 40% of all men across the board will have erectile dysfunction. But one thing that is a little bit worrying is that you were quoting 10 to 15 percent of younger <laughs> men might get erectile dysfunction, right? Yeah, because but... you would think that you know, someone like Nick working so hard for caring pharmacy is that he's just too tired and then sometimes might actually find it difficult to get erection. But wrong in our study, that is a report card in Malaysia looking at thousands and thousands of men in urban and rural settings found that men 18 to 29, I'm sure you fall into that category of 18 to 29. Yeah, actually, still younger 30, than 29. 36.9% of men at that age group will have erectile dysfunction. <laughs> Can you please uh, mute yourself? Yeah, mute yourself. You. Okay, right. <laughs> if you want to join the conversation, we're more than happy for you to go and join the conversation. Initially, everyone thought that this was really... Uh, an artifact, you know, maybe, maybe people over-reporting it. This is pre-COVID, remember? This is like published in 2019 and the study was done before 2018. But later on, we found that there's a lot of correlations between younger men with dyslipidemia, you know, cholesterol issue, blood pressure issue, obesity, youth diabetes. And therefore, we can safely say that this is not an artifact. It actually is a true state of the nation for our men. So imagine so many young men out there are already facing the trouble of getting erectile dysfunction, but this is a tsunami of bad health to come later. If they already get uh, diabetes and that sort of thing, uh, early stage diabetes that they didn't know that manifests itself as erectile dysfunction, they're going to have a lot of problems in the future, such as heart problem, diabetes related, uh, you know, kidney functions problem, retinopathy, and a lot of other problems. So therefore, it is a real early warning that something is going to go wrong in the future. And therefore, sexual health is a good way 
to be a barometer to see the overall health is a big problem. Okay, so you mean that if someone were to have erectile function problem, so they can expect or they have a much higher risk of developing heart problems or you know eye problems oh, later on? Definitely. I will tell you the statistics that will really worry you. Obviously, the other big elephant in the room is that big COVID that kept us all in the house for the last two and a half years, right? I'm sure you are having a revenge going out and revenge traveling and that sort of thing. But, but yeah. remember the time when the COVID first hit. Do you remember the countries that were most hit by COVID at that time were the European countries such as Italy? Do you remember that happened? And interestingly, yeah. in Italy, there's a really interesting uh, study that was published by a good friend of mine called Yannini. Because during that time, Italy and France and Portugal were the first few countries that locked down people first because it was spreading, lots of people were dying. So this was a study looking at COVID, right? So if you, let's say, uh, don't have COVID, but you're locked down at home, obviously you're very stressed. You're stressed about your job, you're stressed about your family get contracted, you're stressed about being locked down at home with, you know, um, in a small room and that sort of thing. And your risk of getting erectile dysfunction is about 10%, 9.3%. But if you get COVID, your actually risk of getting erectile dysfunction is 28%. And these are young men who contracted COVID actually have three-folds increase of getting erectile dysfunction. And also, if you look at it the other way around, if you already have ED, because I, I remember I told you that men who has already got ED has got problem with diabetes, blood pressure, dyslipidemia, their risk of getting COVID is about six times. So therefore, in Italy, they say mask up or end up with erectile dysfunction. And that was a big campaign that actually stopped people from getting COVID so that if you get COVID, you're going to be three times more likely to get erectile dysfunction. But if you already have erectile dysfunction, beware because COVID is going to catch you six times more than other men out in the streets. I'm just wondering why we didn't do it here, is it? Because to men, if I were to wear a mask, I'm a bit, I'm a bit too careful, I'm a bit timid. So if you were to put it that way, you know, if you get COVID, you better mask up. If not, you were to get COVID, you're going to have a big problem with you know, erection. So if you were to do it here, I think it would, it would have a bigger impact. So we will see much of them you know, following the SOP. Uh, I think we should, we should, I, we should really I totally do it. I totally agree with you. But one of the problems about running a project like that or campaign like that in Malaysia or in Asia is that people always assume that when you got erectile dysfunction, it's all in your mind. You know, prior to 1998, actually, most of even the clinician believe that if you have got erectile dysfunction, 90% of the time is psychological. And only 10% of that is like uh, pathological but i'll show you a slide that will worry you it's because the causes of erectile dysfunction contrary to what we believe actually is a lot bigger problems that causes erectile dysfunction i mentioned four which are dyslipidemia cholesterol blood pressure diabetes and also the actual uh, uh, obesity, which is the one that correlate with the report of National Health and uh, Bombity Survey. But if you look at other conditions such as smoking and depression operations, earlier on you asked me what I do for a living, I actually operate on men who has got prostate cancer. The chances of you actually getting erectile dysfunction if you undergo an operation like what Li Shen Long went through, which is robotic radical prostatectomy, the chances of you getting erectile dysfunction can be as high as 60 to 80% in certain center. So that is actually quite staggering. And of course, there are other things such as hormone problems and also other things such as the pills you dispense your patient. So don't even assume a simple thing like blood pressure tablets and then we give the patient, like say, for example, certain type of beta blockers might cause erectile dysfunction. We really need to open up and ask patient, are you sexually active? Because you don't want to be the last thing that you induce erectile dysfunction to patients, right? Yeah. So for our audiences, if you're not sure what beta blocker is, it's actually a type of you know, medication for the heart and also for your blood pressure. 
So if you are not sure, you can always take a medication and ask your doctor. You can always ask your pharmacist to know whether you are taking any kind of beta blocker or whether your erectile dysfunction is actually due to your medication, right? So See, before this you move is why on, you do your job so much better than me. It's because I make assumptions that people know that. And then for you, you're in the front line. You really, you know, all the pharmacists out there and all the general population out there, you really think that the first front line of healthcare providers such as the nurses and also pharmacists are the real frontline people to understand you because in the community, they understand all your medical history and all the other supplements and all the tablets that you take and treat you in totality. The problem about healthcare is that specialists like myself, I treat pathology and one part, but pharmacists like yourself, you treat patient in totality. And that's a very important part where you should play a very vital role to help men who suffer from erectile dysfunction. I think as a pharmacist, our role is mainly to detect any drug-related problem. We don't want for a drug to cause one trouble and then you use another drug to catch that problem. So from one medication, you end up with two medications where you don't really, uh, you, can, you can actually just change the first medication and just solve the problem. So that's what I think. To be honest with you, I think you have a much more important role. Your most important role is actually preventive medicine. Rather than actually dispensing medicine, from the very beginning, your job actually is to highlight the areas that uh, patients can improve on themselves and pre prevent them to even start needing to take the medication to start off with. All right. It's like, you know, uh, so what Dr. Josh mentioned just now, hypertension, high cholesterol, because to them, uh, all of their friends are having that problem, especially a man in their 50s. Oh, yeah, cholesterol slightly higher is fine. You know, sugar level slightly higher is fine. I will just control it myself. I can do it by controlling my diet. They always have this kind of mentality. So sometimes it takes really some effort of, uh, as a pharmacist to tell them, hey, you really have to see a doctor because if you drag it on, it's going to damage you know, your, 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 your arteries, it's going to damage your, your, you know, your, your kidney, and especially in this case, going to damage your, your sexual your, function, your, your, your right? Okay. Potential. I mean, this is the problem is that many men cannot relate that a touch of high glucose, a touch of blood pressure, eventually is going to make your downstairs not working so well. When they understand that, then they will take it a little more seriously. They won't call it a touch of blood pressure, a touch of diabetes, yes. because that itself, they take it more seriously because if they can't function between the sheets, then they lose phrase like malula, right? Okay. Now, a lot of pharmacies, what we do is that we are just trying to, you know, rephrase everything, you know, turn, make a, put what they are most concerned of and then put it right at the front of that. Okay, you have this problem, right? you have this erectile problem, right? So yeah. I think it could be due to your hypertension, your cholesterol and diabetes. So you better go and check it better, just better go and see a doctor, go and get your medication and just follow, follow your, you know, your, your, your course of medication and then see how it goes. You know, Nick, I, I learned so much from my pharmacist colleagues is that the indirect way of a lot of my pharmacist friends actually do when they discuss erectile dysfunction. They will always kind of say things like, you know, many men who take these tablets actually do have erectile dysfunction. I'm sure it's okay with you, but if you do, would you like to talk to me later? And I really think that's a, such a fine way of putting it. Or other things to say, many, many men who suffer from diabetes, you know, will have erectile dysfunction. Your diabetes, although is under control, I'm sure everything's okay. But when you encounter problems, I'm sure that, you know, you know, I'm here to listen. And I think that is a great way to create that rapport. Like you mentioned very beginning in our discussion that it's a hard subject to talk about, right? For men, it is really attacking on their ego. And by actually softening that, opening doors, build that rapport. Because the last thing you want is you go in for cough medicine, you ask someone, ask you, hey, you got erectile dysfunction or not? <laughs> yeah. Right? Okay. So that sort of things to actually open up and then you realize that you can trust somebody and that's when you really have an opportunity to help someone, right? Let's look at the statistics that you told me, you asked me about, right? This is something that I hope is going to strike a little bit of chill down many people's spine. And also the women out there, if you look at this slide, then you're going to drag your men to the clinic tomorrow to make sure that they have themselves checked. 
Imagine that you've got diabetes, you're three times more likely to get erectile dysfunction. If you've got high blood pressure, twice more likely. If you've got high cholesterol, twice more likely. If you're obese, anybody who's got BMI about, you know, above 28, then your risk of getting erectile dysfunction is as high as 79%. And if you're a smoker, you definitely have wilting willy for about two toes. And if you're regular and excessive amount of alcohol, that itself is also detrimental for your sexual health. So all these are statistics that's out there. But for men to relate that glass of wine or that cigarettes in their mouth eventually cause erectile dysfunction and eventually cause problems with heart attacks and cancer. And I think that barometer to tell them that when they get problems with uh, their sexual health is the way for them to start looking for help and to change their lifestyle, it's really quite priceless and paramount. But as a man, I think many men here, we have the same question. Doctor, so what if we are not a heavy drinker, we are just casual drinker, is it okay? Because wow. to us, you know, Chinese, we believe that the alcohol is going to promote blood circulation. So isn't it, isn't it good for, for, for erection then? Well, for the chi and everything, right? Yeah, we believe yeah. the chi. So, yeah, for the chi, yeah. right? So Chinese believe that, you know, you drink some yang mi chiu and that's something <laughs> yes. that comes, right? I would give you one word everything in moderation, right? Okay, so it's like excessive amount of exercise is also going to be damaging. Excessive amount of no cholesterol, no diabetes, no carbohydrate is also going to be damaging. At the end of the day, it is not about the amount, uh, you know, uh, the, whether you can drink or you cannot drink. It's all about moderation. And that moderation will spell your overall health, including your sexual health. Okay, doctor. I think I have to stop you for a while because we will be going into the Q, the, 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 the giveaway session to test you guys whether you are you are paying attention to what Dr. George Lee just said. So the first question, this is the giveaway. Uh, now that we have learned the basics of erectile dysfunction, um, we will be checking whether you know uh, what erectile dysfunction is. So the question is, which age group of men are more likely to have erectile dysfunction? So which age group of men are more likely to have erectile dysfunction? A, 18 to 29 years old. B, 30 to 59 years old. C, 60 years old and above. I repeat, A, 18 to 29 years old. B, 30 to 59 years old or C, 60 and above. So comment your answer in the chat box and three lucky people from the audience will be selected to win a basic health screening by Glen Eagles Hospital KL worth 500 ringgit each. So you can shoot your answers now. So I'm while really they are, while doing, that doing that, as well. so while they are doing that, uh, we can move on. So I think a lot of them, they, 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 they might have a little bit of trouble with you know, erection. So they might be wondering, hey, is this normal? Am I having erectile dysfunction? So how do we know whether we are having erectile dysfunction? Is there a way to like test, test ourselves? Or uh, you know, how, you know, how do doctors normally determine whether a patient is having uh, erectile dysfunction? That's a perfect question because when men have these problems, they imagine like, you know, doctors going to do crazy things to them when they go to clinic, like sticking fingers up their backside and do all sorts of things. But the reality is that it's a very simple determination to find out whether you truly have got erectile dysfunction. You know, no, first of all, we check your medical history. We ask you whether in the past you had any operation, whether you're on any medication. And that's clearly important, which we established later on, uh, early on. And uh, early on, I mentioned to you, like psychologically, for example, whether you're worried about COVID, whether you're about your job, worried about money, worried about relationship. Those are very important mental health that relate to sexual health. And sexual history, obviously, is important. I like to define it into four different sections. You asked about your libido, you know, uh, you know, how often do you have sex? Nick, I'm going to put you on the spot here because you've been putting me on the spot a lot. How okay. often do you think a typical Malaysian man have sex below 40? Below 40? Yeah. Um, I guess. Per month. Uh, I mean, below 40, right? Mm, yeah. Let me guess. Probably well, your friend, Nick, your friend. Times or four times, four times to six times. Probably oh, right, about okay. one time every week. You need to see me. 
Right. Okay, really? <laughs> well, actually, the vast, vast majority of Malaysian men below the age of 40 will have sex about twice a week, which uh, you know, okay. translates to about eight times uh, you know, a month. And then above, six, above 40, then reduce a little bit to about six times. So let's say if you classically just have sex as a couple, maybe about six to eight times a month, and suddenly down to one time, something is not quite right. It's because your hormone is not really quite right. So that's one possibility. And also other sexual history, you know, you wake up in the morning, whether you get morning erection is another good one. And then whether halfway through sexual activity, you couldn't sustain your erection. Other things that's important, let's say, for example, reproductive uh, health, whether you can ejaculate, whether ejaculation is painful, the duration of ejaculation, and determine whether someone truly suffers from erectile dysfunction or premature ejaculation. And all these are important sexual history to establish. And then later on, a quick medical examination for you, Nick. It's a very simple thing like the blood pressure. It's a simple thing like measuring the urine, checking uh, you know, issues like you know, the glucose, uh, glucosmity. And then those are the things. And only then, you know, a simple blood test like fasting glucose and also cholesterol. And that's as simple as it goes when you get assessed by the doctor. However, if you're too embarrassed to see doctors, then this is something that you should think about. Actually, there's something called erectile hardness score. And it's a very simple things like how hard or how soft it is, grade one to four. In Taiwan, they really want to play a little bit of humor into this. They actually call a four a mighty cucumber, a soft tofu, a one, and anything in between, a peel and unpeeled bananas as a four, as a three and a two. So I think by doing that, you actually just break down that taboo and get men a little bit less of that ego problems. And then you can self-diagnose whether you are mighty cucumber or are you a soft little tofu? And I think that's a good way that I have many of my clients coming to see me and say, doc, doc, it's not so bad, la, but it is still a unpeeled bananas. So you can roughly know that it's a three. So that's a good way to discuss it with your doctors. And that also break down that kind of like a, a anxiety and uneasiness. I think that is a very good way to put it because sometimes you were to, if, you, if you were to ask a patient, you know, how bad your erectile dysfunction is. It, it's always a very subjective scale, right? Uh, uh, okay, la, a bit, la, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit bad, la, a bit bad, la. what does a bit bad mean, right? But when exactly. You of, and you don't want of, to go through the whole embarrassing technical part, like, so a bit bad, like, you know, when they go in, like, you know, halfway through, <laughs> you know, like yeah. 30%, uh, 45%, uh, that sort of thing. And then that itself, it will just put you off completely to talk about, like, percentages mm. of erection you might as well just introduce a bit of humor and that itself will lessen all that taboo. Mm. But I think, Doctor, I think just now you were mentioning about uh, libido, erectile dysfunction, and also premature ejaculation. But a lot of patients, they sometimes they will confuse between all these three concepts. Are they like something that's different or you know, if they are ejaculating too fast, is it that is under erectile dysfunction? Such a brilliant question. You know, when our bodily function when it comes to desire for sex is called libido as controlled by testosterone. Testosterone gives you that desire. And when your testosterone is low, it means that something is wrong, right? For example, is let's say testosterone will protect your muscular health, your bone health. But when your testosterone is low, that you used to have sex about eight times a month and then suddenly down to eight times, you know, uh, one times every eight months, then you realize that your testosterone level is low. And that is something called andropause or male menopause. However, if somebody from the very first time they have sexual activity, they can sustain that erection, but they ejaculate very fast. For example, around one minute, a typical man is between five to eight minutes. Then this person hasn't got erectile dysfunction. They have got premature ejaculation. So as a clinician, I really need to listen very carefully because you don't want to treat the patient incorrectly. Mm -hmm. So all three are different concepts or different problems and they all three, they will have different sort of treatments, right? Absolutely right. Three okay. different pathology, three different treatment modalities. Okay, but for patients, if they were to have erectile dysfunction, is it like really the end of the road or is there treatments available for them? Is oh, there like a solution? I tell you. And because we all know about the blue pill, right? Whenever, whenever we talk about 
you know, if you're dysfunctional, oh, blue pill, blue pill, blue pill. That's right. So okay. How does the blue pill help? Okay. The blue pill is one of the treatment modalities. Early on, I mentioned to you 1998, way before you were born, right? Okay. It's because the blue pill, actually, believe it or not, was introduced about 24 years ago, right? Okay. It's because actually it was an accidental drug. It's a very simple drug that intended to treat high blood pressure. And it was tested on a group of patients. One group actually had, uh, you know, the real stuff. The other one had a placebo, which is dummy pill. And when they realized that it doesn't work for blood pressure and suddenly retracted all the pills, the people who had the real pills didn't want to return them because suddenly their dragon was released, right? Okay. And then that's how the blue pill was uh, introduced. But now, 23, 24 years down the line, it becomes the first line treatment. And these group of drugs, uh, such as sedanafil, tadanafil, vedanafil, and udanafil, which is available across all pharmacies, are the first line treatment. The second line treatment, even before the 1998, we actually put little pellets into the urethra where the urine comes out or inject directly into the penis to achieve erection. Obviously, not so common. But third line, it actually is penile prosthesis. We put in a fake penis so that men can actually just have no feel, but when they press a button, they get erection. Imagine how lucky we are born in 2022 is because we actually have these drugs that a lot of men prior to 1998 didn't have that opportunity to enjoy. But Nick, I want to put this way. First line treatment, although it's a drug, but I beg to defer. I think first line treatment is lifestyle modification because that itself is a long-term solution so that sometimes we dispense the medication, but we urge the patient to really watch their diet and watch what they eat. And that's what we put into this. So erectile dysfunction is not just treating your erection. Just give you a pill, get you sorted out for that six hours or so, because the whole idea is that when we have the opportunity to see you, we test what is wrong. We will cut, advise you how to cut down on uh, alcohol and smoking, how to help you to lose weight and how to help you to reduce stress. And that itself might be the best consultation you have had done because overall, it doesn't just save your sexual health, it saves your overall health. But a lot of patients, they, 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 they really want to... Uh, they really want to reduce their stress. They really want to lose weight. But sometimes, they, what they want, but they just end up not doing. So how do you encourage them, doctor? Because a lot of them say, they will say, okay, tomorrow I'll go for a jog, right? You know, uh, not tomorrow I will, tomorrow I'll cut down my alcohol. But they would just, they would continue dragging on for one year, two years down the road. They are still doing the same thing. So uh, what kind I of fully agree you with you. Watch? It's like, you know, I've, as some of you may look at my Instagram pictures, like from about three years ago, I was 108 kilo, right? Okay. And then for me, on the old days, it's just like, you know, you want to start any form of diet, want to start any form of exercise. It's impossible. I can tell you that now when I put on weight, I find it really difficult to actually bring it down. But that motivation has to come in pair. For example, when I introduce the treatment to the patient, I tell them that this treatment is going to work if you put in that effort as well. So because no man wanted to be dependent on medicine, however, if they work concurrently, they will feel better and their dependency on medicine reduces. It's not because they are hooked on the drugs, it's because of their overall health get better. They don't need the medication in many ways. So the things that I tell them, there are five things that make you a healthier person. Number one, don't underestimate the power of sleep. Let lots of rest because your body can rest and then that will regulate your blood pressure and also your mental health. Number two is hydrate yourself. Always drink between 2 to 2.5 liters of water because water is a source of light. Number three, don't need to go to the gym. Do help your wife to do some household chore. Make yourself sweat. Go up and down the stairs. Carry some you know, rubbish outside because those things actually burns you a lot of calories as well. And then also, when you eat, always in moderation. You know, if you like rice, cut that half, it will fill you, but fill it up with another portions of vegetables and then always make it balanced. Everyone loves nasi lemak, but you can have a few spoonfuls and don't go all out, then you'll be okay. 
And lastly, always treasure your loved ones and actually protect your mental health. That communications with your partner and do it together. And I think those five uh, formula always work for my patient. It worked for me, it'll work for you. Before we move on, I would like to thank Dr. Joshi on behalf of my mother, on behalf of all ladies in the world. Thank you for uh, asking the husbands do the do the chores. I think they really, really thank you for that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so you don't need the blue pill. Tonight, your, your spouse will be really grateful that you really contribute. And that is a lot more romantic than the flowers. I tell you that. Okay. Doctor, so how about it? Because you could mention that it could be due to uh, body or, you know, high blood pressure, diabetes, or you know, cholesterol problems. But you also mentioned that another part of the, another part of the problem is actually what's in the brain, right? So if let's say they are, they are having like stress or if they're having other forms of anxiety, so how would you advise or what kind of, what kind of treatment is available for all this? Yeah, this? absolutely. I mean, we all know that sexual health is, uh, you know, it's combinations of your mental uh, ability and also your physical activities right okay so in the past we used to think that it's all in the mind but of course there's a 30 percent that it might be in the mind then i would like you to think about sexual health is a form of a you know revisiting your relationship with your partner and in malaysia we don't really get so many of these sexual uh, psychosexual counseling uh, like in the uk uh, you know where i was trained however it's actually just common sense, okay? The common sense is that if, let's say, for example, after 25 years of marriage, and then every time it's the same thing all the time, same bed, same room, same music, same everything, then it naturally just takes uh, a bit of in, uh, you know, intuitive and also um, a bit of effort trying to change things a little bit. Like, for example, that romantic dinner, that bath, that massage, and all those things, actually it's a form of relationship therapy it's essentially just open up communication to say what i like about you what i fell in love with you those many years ago and then that is the part where it's really important so all other things is that open up to your partner for example if covid stresses you out talk about it men are not so good in talking about their stresses so talk about your anxiety your stress and then if necessary get a counsellor because a counsellor is going to use something like cognitive behaviour therapy, how to identify the areas that you don't like or you find it really un uncomfortable about sex and then talk about it. So slowly build up your self-esteem, your sexuality and also your uh, interpersonal relationship. All these, a lot of it's common sense, but if sometimes it's just too embarrassing to discuss it, there's always a good way to get a third party involved, such as a counsellor. So I guess the takeaway here is to find a way to spice things up because yeah, it's like you know, eating nasi lemak every, every day for 25 years. So we just we need to get something to spice things up. Yeah, absolutely. You want more cucumber in uh, nasi lemak. <laughs> okay. Uh, but a lot of men, right, um, they are, they are they, because we were talking about me uh, medication or treatment, uh, a lot of Asians, we are always very cautious with medication. We are always worried that, you know, will, will I get addicted to it? Or, you know, there must be some side effect, right? Because uh -huh. it, is not, it is not natural. Medication is not natural. There must be some side effect. So what is your advice for them? Is it, oh, is it true that they can I get addicted you, to it? I hear it all the time. Like you mentioned the yang ming chiu, all the alcohol, all the snakes, all the tiger penis, all the tonka ali and that sort of things, right? I mean, a lot of the time, some of them may have very small study that show that it worked for a small group of populations, but it's very difficult to beat a, a, a medication that has been around for 24 years that is the most scrutinized medication. So why try all these things when your relationship drift apart? And worse still, some of you might even get the wrong things like a counterfeit, which I'm going to talk about. So why do men go to internet to do that? I and mean, first of all, they're embarrassed, right? You know, sometimes people go online like this. They talk about my friend has got erectile dysfunction. And then some, it's because 60% of men bypass consultation because they think that what they get on the internet is going to be the same. Wrong. Because when you go to internet to get a pill, Number one, you don't know whether it's a real thing. Number two, you miss that opportunity for us to treat you in totality. And also, when you buy online, you think that it is, um, you know, trustworthy. 
But remember, what you buy online has no accountability. When you put it in your mouth, if anything happens to you, there's no coming back. There is no accountability. You can't go back to, you know, Nick, the pharmacist, and say that you gave me that pill and it's a wrong pill because nobody is going to be accountable for you. How cheap can your life be if you just buy a pill and put it in your mouth? And that's crazy, right? And then also, a lot of time, it's because of embarrassment. Because you're too embarrassed to talk about this, you might as well just go online as an anonymous person. And also, one way of actually putting it is because you perceive that these drugs are so expensive, then you don't want to buy it you know, uh, with a reputable pharmacy. You go online, but a lot of time you ended up paying more because you, know, you don't really know how much it is because there are so many range of medication that actually may help you and it's not as expensive as you think. And also, one last thing I always tell my patient, you don't want your sexual experience to be cheap, right? Because you want your sexual experience to be a priceless diamond moment that you can remember all your life. And what you know, better thing to make it, make sure that the medication you consume is safe and efficacious. And that makes that relationship or that encounter priceless. Yes. From what I remember before this, right, before the, the, the era of you know uh, ease, uh, online stores or internet, all you can find are those the Ubat Lucky Quad that you see actually at the, 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 the street lamps. It's, it's actually stick uh, at the side of the road. That's the only source for those, you know, Ubat Lucky Quad. But now it's all over the internet. You can find it on, I think, Facebook. You can find it on a lot of the online, the online, the online, the the online stores. So all of this medication is basically everywhere. So I think it's, it's so they need to know that uh, these medications are actually regulated. So they have to go and see a doctor to get it. And those that are outside that are actually on, that you can buy it from, let's say Shopee or whatever. Okay. I mean, it, 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 yeah, it, uh, it, 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 is, it is likely that it's something wrong with it or it's not a genuine, genuine medication. Nick, I am so heartbroken. One day, my patient told me that I was a picture of me and also a recording of me was used, uh, you know, for selling all these supplements to say that Obak Quat Lelaki. And then they took a, a, a like recording like today and then she sell Obak Lelaki and then to, to sell it. I was heartbroken to find out. So we're trying to get down to the bottom of it. What is a selling point? They're selling one thing. is natural. So that's why it's natural. It's like, but when you look at a lot of studies done by Pfizer, they realize that what is claimed to be natural, a lot of them are adulterated with sildenafil, which is the blue pill's uh, active component. And so therefore, don't be fooled by the naturalness because at the end of the day, you might actually just be buying something that is so dangerous. Because, you know, at the end of the day, what is there to be embarrassed about? Uh, um, on the bright side, uh, Dr. G, it means that you are now the ambassador for men's health. You see, so people have to put your face to make their product look more credible. So that is right. that is the bright side of the of the story. The I guess. Unfortunate thing is that what they're selling is not credible. So I'm <laughs> yeah. crying because I, you know, the number of times that we have been approaching these people and actually just cl uh, clamp them down. Another image came out. Another image came out. So. I guess you are looking at the kind of like, a, you know, the bright side of it, that there is some discussion about um, uh, men's health. But my fear is that my image and also my persona yes. is going to harm people out there. So just be careful. Go and see your doctor. Don't be fooled by that video that you see on the YouTube. Just as a conclusion, Dr. G never endorsed any. Any, any weird treatments online. So if you see I am Dr. Josh, categorically to, say that it's not me. All right. Next to any Uber lucky quad, it is not him. Let me I know, emphasize, I know. it is not okay. him, okay? Yeah, okay? So before we move on, it's time for the next giveaway question. So the question is, everyone ready? Everyone ready? So the next question is, name three causes of erectile dysfunction. Okay, name three causes of erectile dysfunction. This is the second and last question, yeah? So comment your answer in the comment section. Uh, and this time, three lucky people from the audience will be selected to win carrying cash voucher worth 50 ringgit each. So you may shoot your answers now. Okay, so while they are doing that, uh, let's continue from where we, where we left off just now. So uh, how about supplements? Because 
you know, a lot of Chinese, right, they, they believe that you have to take some tonic. They always say tonic. They always want, they always want to skip the medication. They want to go with something that's milder so it can treat their condition in the long run so they do not have to rely on medications. So what do you think about all these supplements or you know, herbal yeah. treatments well, that can help in ED? Early on, I said about the supplement I endorse is completely incorrect. It's not me. And then the other things that I would like to find out is that sometimes all these supplements and things that you want to talk to your doctors, it's all very embarrassing. And then your head has got all these words that juggle in your head. Important things. Think about what you want to say and then write them down. Find the words that you're comfortable with. If let's say talking about making love is something you feel comfortable, talk about making love. Whatever way it is, and then track down all your symptoms so that you can discuss it with your doctor properly. However, if you truly can't bring yourself to talk to your doctor, and then you are risking yourself going to all these supplements, imagine that a lot of supplements actually are counterfeit medicine as well. So about the lucky and all sorts of things, of course, a lot of these adulterated. A lot of them have very, very small studies, but the counterfeit uh, uh, as equally scary from all these supplements that don't do anything is a counterfeit medicine. It's because at best, you probably will be taking medicine that actually has no content, right? So it's a dummy pill. It's probably Smarties, but you don't come to any harm. But imagine that that dummy pills actually contains excess amount of um, uh, sildenafil, which is the active component of PDE5 inhibitors, and that may kill you. If you're lucky, you get a lower amount. If you're not lucky, you get an excess amount or the one that actually mixed with other medication because these are the ones that has been used, produced in the back garden. Can you imagine that? And all these are the clips that we see. Hati-hati dengan ubat palsu yang membunuh. So like, you know, all these supplements and mumbo jumbos that you put in your mouth just because you want obat lelaki kuat, danger in fate, parasang sex, dalam, you know, uh, all these uh, newspaper things that you see, you know, you see copy has got like, a, you know, um, uh, all these supplements. But at the end of the day, nothing really beats a healthier lifestyle. So don't go for things that is quick fix. So your question to me is that, should people go for supplement? Why spend money on supplement? Why spend on money on supplement that is not really scrutinized? Spend time and effort in making your health better. Sleep more, hydrate more, do some household chores and have a more balanced diet and also less stress. That itself, it's tenfold better than ubat kuat lelaki. So you might as well take the money and then just enjoy a very nice romantic dinner with your partner. And then do your household chore after that. <laughs> Dr. Josh, you just have to re-emphasize do your household chores. Yeah. So, um, but the problem with a lot of this, uh, because it is everywhere online, so I'm not, it's a bit hard for them to, um, to differentiate what is, what is genuine medication and what is not genuine medication, but my advice is just anything that is not coming from your doctor or the pharmacist, you just have to assume that it's not something that is right. So make sure if you were to get your medication, make sure you're getting it from a doctor or, you know, um, so if you're so you not getting from a pharmacist, make sure you have a, you have, you're going to see a doctor first, get a prescription before you see a pharmacist to get, you know, ED treatments or the blue pills. Right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, Nick, you have come across clients who bring in pills to you and say doc you know uh, you know my dear pharmacist is this real we can't tell the difference right. and it's like you know, leave alone like you know the, because sometimes it can be so good in the um, fake one so the easiest thing to do is just if you respect and also you know value your health and your body don't buy a pill online and put it in your mouth just because you're embarrassed right because imagine these are the things that can do to you as a counterfeit, right? Counterfeit medicine can mean death because incorrect amount, like I said to you, if they, 100 milligrams of sildenafil is the maximum you should take. If they put in 300, you're going to die. So if they actually mix it with wrong ingredient, just imagine that the prior, the machine previous to that 
was built to treat patients with diabetes. And suddenly, you, the sildenafil was the next batch of drugs and it's mixed together because it's not regulated. You're going to get um, diabetes medicine. And in Singapore, people die in ICU and they lost their kidney function because of that. And at best, you might get nothing at all, just a smarties. But sometimes a lot of these drugs, you're not allowed to take them. For example, sildenafil, if you've got a heart condition called angina and you're taking GTN, go and see your doctor because by the time you take this pill, it might mean death. So it's not a simple thing as I just got this pill from my friend or my neighbor's neighbors because it's all about seizing the opportunity to make sure that you're overall healthy and making sure that the treatment you get is the best quality so that your sexual health and your over health, overall health is looked after. I think the takeaway here is if something is too good to be true, then it is too good to be true. Because if it is something like a supplement that you buy online, it is highly unlikely to give you like an instant effect like pseudonafil. So if it's too good to be true, there is some, there's definitely something fishy about it. Yeah, I mean, imagine all these, you know, advert about, you know, you rub some, uh, you know, some creams on your uh, private parts and suddenly tomorrow it will be like 10 centimeters bigger. You never believe that. And why would you actually rubbing is one thing? And why would you put a pill in your mouth and think that's by tomorrow, sometimes you're going to be a superman. So don't be fooled by that. But uh Doctor, you will be really surprised because probably they won't go and see a doctor and talk about this. But I have plenty of you know uh, patients that come to me and ask me about this, this, this uh, pill that they found online, whether I have the stock where they claim that they can really do everything from enlarging, from you know premature uh, solving premature ejaculation, solving it's really everything, including toning your muscle. I was like, oh, really? Everything in one? But yeah, they, they, and they, curing they, cancer, they, they, right? Okay. Yeah. And then, so therefore, you know, uh, uh, an event like this, obviously I'm very thankful where, uh, you know, to yourself caring and also Vitris and also Glen Eagles, an event like this, bringing us lots of opportunity to bring awareness. And then that is about health literacy. It's about making sure that you're more informed and don't harm yourself. Yeah. And hopefully along the way, you actually benefit from something like this. You make yourself have a better overall health and also more importantly, uh, you have a better sexual health with you and your partner. Thank you, doctor. I think we can move on with the Q&A session. There's actually quite a lot of questions. Everyone is so, uh, so concerned about their health, so they're really blasting us with a lot of questions. So let's let me fire go the question. The, yeah, let me go with the first one. First one actually is something that I want to ask, but... Um, uh, it's a bit not related to this topic. It's something that you mentioned regarding what you what you did in the UK. Uh, she's asking about a gender reassignment. Is sex change? Yeah, that that, that, that is that, correct. That is, yeah. yeah. So, so sex change can be boy to girl, girls to boys. Unfortunately, there are certain regulations in certain countries that prohibit that. But you're absolutely right. Gender reassignment is actually done by plastics and urologists. Okay. Next question. And the next question will be a bit wild. Wow, so, uh. That on form for, for this um, uh, audience, uh, she is asking about a theory. I think it's a conspiracy theory. Um, the population theory is quite accurate because COVID vaccine uh, was indirectly to sterilize humans so as to produce less. So there are always a lot of conspiracy around you know, yeah. uh, vaccines. Uh, that is bad for that is bad for. Oh, I think there is one regarding. I would I think it was Nikki Minaj or something like that regarding that. Uh, her friend's cousin in Trinidad or something like that took the vaccine and then the testicles were swollen. That is a real thing. They they she reposted it on 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 so on Twitter and really set the whole Twitter on fire. So is it true that the vaccine? Well, is- there are two things in science. One is anecdotal science. That is when you actually just kind of like hearsay. You know, my friend's friends had this problem and then it's not verified and then no, nowhere that it can be verified. And also there is a robust scientific studies. And in the robust scientific studies, imagine how many millions and millions and billions of people have had the vaccine and vast majority of them have no problems. So I think we can safely say that 
thanks to the vaccine, we are all still breathing air without the fear of catching COVID. And even if we catch COVID, we're not going to die. So therefore, if for those minority, if that truly happens with fertility, I truly cannot bring my heart to believe that it's conspiracy theory to sterilize the whole population. So I disagree. Anyway, next question. Okay, this is a bit, uh, this is quite a long uh, question, but I will really try to help him, help him out. Uh, this is Mr. J. Yeah? Uh, the question is, I have some inquiries. I'm 29 this year, and I'm currently fighting a few chronic illness. Uh, illnesses, heart issues, colon cancer, rare disorders like achalasia, cardia. I'm also currently on multiple antidepressants, multiple relaxants, psychosis medication, and a heavy amount of sleeping pills to keep me in sleep. So ever since my health battle started in 2021 at the age of 28 with multiple surgeries, I can say I do not have fantasy, masturbation, erection, or even the feeling to get intimate or watching pornography, in, uh, not even morning wood. So uh, no, I have not had sexual intercourse for the last 29 years of my life. I'm worried for my future. Is there any advice for me to be able to perform sexually or any specialist I need to consult? Uh, I know antidepressant might be one of the causes, but without antidepressant, I go into self-harm and suicide. So how can I balance it up? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, I'm really, really glad that you, uh, all, you, know, you, uh, you communicate with us about all the problems that you have. And the best thing to do actually is to consolidate all those data. Because remember, when we treat you, we treat you in totality as overall health. And all of us as clinicians will be there to help you in order to see what is suitable and what is not suitable. I really think that, you know, um, to treat erectile dysfunction or less libido is not just a specialist subject for andrologists or urologists. It actually, it's a job for all clinicians and healthcare providers. I'm sure that if you mention it to your psychiatrist or to your oncologist, they'll be more than happy to initiate you on treatment. And good luck to you. Yeah, good luck. So I'll move on to the next question. Um, doctor, any study on which race group has more ED? Just a uh, just out of curiosity, not a racist question. Ha, oh, ha, ha. Right. Okay. Um, actually, you are right that we always want to find out that, you know, whether what race group. Oh, interestingly, there are different groups of people who have different set of problems. For example, different group of people have more risk of diabetes and then more risk of um, uh, high blood pressure. And that's a group of uh, demographic that will have more ED. So the study that I quoted early on, National Health and Sur uh, Mobility Survey, didn't specify racially, but we know racial breakdown when it comes to diabetes and also obesity may be more prevalent in one group of um, uh, races. And then that group of races uh, will probably have more risk of uh, ED. So uh, the next question would be, um, is there any scientific study done on those consuming Viagra pills together with Tonkat Ali? So can oh. they be taken together? Yeah, yeah. Is there any interaction? Sure. Tonkat Ali actually is a medication in order to enhance uh, somebody's testosterone and libido. And then Sidenafil, which is the blue pill, it's purely just to enhance the circulation. There are many, many studies that actually show that in combination, in some way, you actually get that enhanced effect of higher libido and better erection. But remember, a lot of sexual health problems actually or treatment has a lot of placebo effect. So for example, you put a pill inside, you think that you're Superman, actually the pill is a dummy pill. That is called placebo effect. So many of these studies done are actually not versus a placebo. So some of them are on real pills, some of them are the fake pills and look at the overall difference. So therefore, a study uh, done like that, which has no correlations with placebo, is difficult to say whether it works or not. But definitely, many people take Tonka Ali together with the blue pill. The next question is actually regarding uh, how ED happens. Because I think a lot of them want to know why I am having ED. So the question is, is ED related to improper blood circulation? ED is related to three things. You need erection. If uh, you, your erection can only be achieved out of three things. Number one, a good patent blood vessel that to supply the penis. Number two, good enough nerve supply so that it can actually react to sexual stimulation. Number three, it actually needs a hormone, which is 
the testosterone in order to motivate that libido. So if any one of these three is impaired, then your ED is a big problem. So therefore, someone who's got diabetes actually will kill it all because in diabetes, you've got neuropathy, you've got arteriopathy, and also you will reduce your testosterone. So therefore, stay away from uh, diabetes. If you've got risk of diabetes, for example, family history, then always be more cautious about the carbohydrate you eat. Okay, so the next question will be, uh, I'm just curious about ED, how long of maintaining erection is considered a normal erection? Okay, earlier on, I said to you that the actual normal is when you finish the job, right? Okay, and that range is actually being worked out that a typical man actually ejaculate between uh, five to eight minutes. Also, therefore, if you can sustain that erection between five to eight minutes, actually is considered normal. However, for some men, that can be a lot, lot longer. For some men, it can be a lot, lot shorter. So it's a range of variation. But in summary, most men can actually, from the start of the job until they finish a job, it's, a min, uh, it's between five to eight minutes. Next question. How does obesity relate to ED? Because oh, right. obesity is just being fat, right? So how does it affect? Okay, there are two reasons why. Obesity tends to be related to something called metabolic syndrome. So in metabolic syndrome, your testosterone drops, your blood pressure goes up, you have high blood, uh, high, uh, blood lipid, and also uh, you're more prone to diabetes. And that's the reason why obesity has that problem. So it's, the first part is a metabolic syndrome. The second part is that someone who has got obesity obviously are less likely to be active and then they are more likely to have problems with low energy and then also less um, kind of like stamina in order to have, uh, uh, you know, between that eight to uh, five to eight minutes of sexual intercourse. And therefore, obesity itself may actually be more higher risk of getting erectile dysfunction. Up to 79% of obese men actually suffers from erectile dysfunction. I think that question is really, really interesting one. Uh, will a higher dose, higher dose of you know, blue pill, will a higher dose give longer erection or just a stronger e erection? Okay, actually, um, the dosage that we know is the maximum dose that you achieve, it's actually 100 milligram. So we know that if you take uh, 25 milligram, 50 milligram, and 100 milligram, and then it will have an increment in the hardness. So it may go from grade one to grade three and grade three to grade four after an increment of the dosage. So it will have improvement in the degree of hardness, but the long, the length of the hardness is actually your uh, time from penetration to ejaculation. So it's not the timing, actually it's the degree of hardness that it creates. Okay. Uh, the next question is quite technical as well. Uh, will tamsulosin hydrochloride, which is a medication for those people with prostate problems, uh, will tamsulosin cause ED? All right. On the contrary, a lot of these uh, medications for uh, prostate, uh, for example, um, tamsulosin, alfuzosin, doxazosin, men who take them actually notice that they get increasingly more erection. So therefore, the muscle relaxant in order to help you to pee better, on one hand, actually will help you to some degree get slightly better erection, but you will not be able to ejaculate. It's because tamsulosin itself relaxes the ejaculatory apparatus for you to have a proper propulsion of the semen. So when you take that medication, it helps you to pee like a trooper, but you will have dry orgasm. That's so very But it doesn't mm. cause erectile dysfunction. To talk okay. contrary, it might improve your erection a little bit. That's a new concept to me as well. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next one is also quite an interesting one. Uh, heard that chefs or cooks, you know, their lower part are always exposed to heat. Does this affect their fertility and erection? Absolutely. Lots and lots of study to show that 
um, you know, people who work in the kitchen, chef, and also bakeries, and then the oven itself is actually uh, in the low part so that it doesn't cause injury whenever you take, uh, you know, all the hot stuff out of the oven. And then men in that sort of working hazard has got slightly lower um, uh, sperm counts. And then the quality of sperm slightly lower as well. So under those circumstances, Dr. G's advice is probably wear loose underpants and then let it hang a little bit so that you get a little bit of aeration and get a little bit of cooling effect. So hopefully uh, you, you don't have to quit your job and then you, know, you can still maintain your fertility and achieve fatherhood. The next question is also quite interesting, actually. I think a lot of people even, a lot of people uh, you know they ask me this question as well. So regarding uh, too much of sexual activity, you know, I, uh, I have a guy friend that aged 50 and still ejaculate around three times per day and almost every day. And he told me the last time even more when he's younger, is there any risk or concern regarding that? Because a lot of like uh, Asians, we believe that there's a quota. So if you were to do it too much earlier on, you will have, you, you, your quota will be over, so you'll be having ED later on. Yeah, is okay. That, is that, is that... Right. Do you believe in that quota? And what do you think your quota is? <laughs> I, I don't think that it's real because that but do, you no think, is... do you think there's a quota in fact if you look at all these Taoism and then they, their quota is something like you know, twice a month and then that's not <laughs> a long quota right okay and then you know there's a Chinese saying that like, Qing Qing Ren Wang you know if you yeah, that's right. you know, yes. and then that's it you're going to die right okay all, right. But all these are house uh, kind of like um, you know like old wives tale for example you know in the old wives tale to say that masturbation too much you're going to go blind and then have you seen many blind people in the streets because they masturbate too much? And I think it's quite variable when it comes to different people's sexual appetite. So, you know, for one person who ejaculate maybe three times a day might be perceived uh, excessive, but other people, you know, three times uh, a year might be perceived uh, excessive. It's because it's of a cultural, religious and society upbringing. And then that is your perception of sex is uh, doing that way. And I really think it's quite damaging for you to say, I want to follow this 50-year-old man so that I can be a little bit quiet. And then what's the point that you ejaculate that all that many times that you are actually achieving nothing? It's all about sexual relationship. It's about sexual health. It's not about the frequency. It's about the quality with your loved ones. So one thing that you want to know is that will you do it any harm? And in fact, there's one study to show that if you ejaculate in your younger years of more than 21 times a month, then your risk of getting prostate cancer is reduced by about 20 times, uh, 20%. So what it translates to is that frequent ejaculation doesn't necessarily harm you, but to some degree, it might be protective against prostate cancer. So therefore, don't be really hard on yourself and feel guilty that if you ejaculate so often that you need to be abstinent for, uh, abstinent for another 30 years because you use up all your quota. Because then on the contrary, you're not really going to go blind, but you might protect yourself from getting prostate cancer. So 21, 10, 21 times in a month, is it? Which is yeah, about that will work out to times around you know, five times a, a week. A week. Yeah, Nick is trying to work out whether he... Achieved yeah, so or... we have a lot more work to do, I guess. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so I think before we end the session, um, uh, Doctor, I think there's a lot of people who, 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 who are having this kind of ED problems. You know, they already tried foreplay, they tried everything, but they still couldn't get the erection. So what is the best way to kind of solve the awkwardness, you know, because on, on both sides, because the man might feel guilty, the lady will also feel guilty. The lady will feel guilty because they probably she thinks that she is not attractive enough. And the guy is probably feeling that you know she is you no, know, he is not mature enough. So what is the best solution to it? Do they just well, stop? You know? First of all, it's recognition. Recognize that you have a problem because a lot of time men just say that, oh, it's because I was tired, it's because yesterday I had an all night, it's because you no know, work is so busy. There's 1,001 reason why you think that you have ED and then don't go and see a doctor. So recognition that it's a problem because it happened repeatedly. Number two, it's communication. Always communicate with your loved ones so that you don't do things in secret, right? Okay. Number three is always build up that courage to seek help. And then the matter of uh, help, uh, getting help 
in a more respectable manner, not getting help from Dr. Google and also Mr. You know, uh, Obakwad. And then it's all about seriously trying to improve your overall health and your sexual health. And lastly, it's a long process of maintaining good overall health and sexual health. It's not about taking a pill and you get it hard and that's it. It's about making sure that you always look out for your blood pressure, always look out for your cholesterol, always look out for your glucose, always stay healthy, always sleep well, and always do your household chores. Always do your household chores. So that will be the, the takeaway message. So guys, if you want to have a better erection, always do your household chores. Okay? Exercise. Yeah, exercise. So thank you, doctor. Any more last words? Well, my whole last word is that ED, it's already a hard subject, right? Okay. And when you get a hard subject, actually, it might be an early sign of a broken heart, right? So don't have a broken heart. And then the hard subject, hopefully, will eventually make sure that you can always sustain a mighty cucumber. Okay, so thank you everyone who has joined this webinar and thank you, Dr. Really thank you. Even for me as pharmacist, I learned a lot, you know, regarding masturbation because a lot we even as pharmacy, we believe that you know, too much masturbation is bad sometimes, but it's a really new concept to, to, to me that it's actually something that is good for health. In fact, it can reduce the risk of prostate. Uh, problems. So really thank you, doctor, for your extensive knowledge on erectile dysfunction with all of us. So as for viewers eager to win the giveaway, we'll be announcing the winners on our Caring Facebook page soon. So make sure you keep an eye on that page. So if you have missed the earlier part of this webinar, no worries as this session will be available on our Caring Pharmacy Facebook page. So while you're at it, don't forget to like Caring Pharmacy and Vitri's uh, Facebook page. So goodbye, everyone. Goodbye, doctor. Thank you so much. And hopefully next time we meet face to face rather than virtual. Yeah. Yeah. I have a lot more questions to ask you in person, doctor. Yeah. Your neighbor is interested, right? My neighbor is interested. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. See ya. All the best, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. And hopefully you everyone keep safe and keep healthy.